We are uh, four weeks in to uh, Luke chapter 1, which means we are cruising. We are like at hypersonic speeds, supersonic speeds. Uh, John MacArthur, famous pastor, for 43 years is said to have averaged five verses a week. So, I mean, we're pretty much at warp speed. That We're going to finish up Luke chapter 1. It's only been a month that we were in Luke chapter 1. Remember, as we're studying this, and I said a good, a good mental uh, game experiment you can play with yourself is to think that, to keep this fresh in your hearts, that you're in that first century church, and you've received this, this uh, little book that's been copied by hand. It's been passed around to all the churches. A copy of Luke came to your church, and the, the leaders, the pastor's leaders, have read out of this text to you, and you're hearing this for the first time, and how Luke he wrote this, remember, to noble Theophilus, which either is a, a real person's name, a friend, or, or he's a lover of God. It means everybody who loves God, he wrote this for you. And uh, Luke investigated this, and he interviewed people, and he uh, got all this information about Jesus together, and he put it together, uh, talking to the apostles themselves, so it would be trustworthy, and we can depend on it. Now, I want you to also remember, as we're going through this, that at the end of the Old Testament, which was Malachi, this last Old Testament prophet, there's approximately 400 years of silence. And in the Old Testament, you have all these great promises, and you have this expectation. Because they remember when they were down in Egypt, remember? And all that long time as they were slaves, but God remembered them, and then God came with them. God came down to be with them. There was a, the, the pillar of fire, remember? And he led them out of Egypt. He sa saved them with his mighty right arm, and he brought them into the promised land. There was this expectation that God is with his people, that God with his mighty power was going to come down, and he was going to save them again. And in Malachi, there was this prophecy that the S-U-N son, the son of righteousness, would rise. That on, on these people that are trapped in darkness without hope, on these people that are, that are afraid of death, the life just goes on and on. It's without purpose. It's without meaning. They don't know if there's a God. They, they've forgotten if God really cares. Their lives seem empty. On these people living in darkness, the sun will rise. It's a sun of righteousness. It will come down on the land. It will cast away the fears. It will bring warmth and light and hope. And we know that that was the Messiah. That was Jesus Christ. There was this messianic expectation throughout the Old Testament. And also Malachi tells us that before this kingdom of God would be established, that one like Elijah would come and he would turn people's hearts to God and turn fathers' hearts back to their sons and their sons' hearts back to their father. God is a relational God. He turns our hearts towards him and he draws us together in relationship. This is how the Old Testament ends. If you are Jewish, my friends, and you don't believe that this Jewish rabbi from 2,000 years ago, Jesus, if you don't believe that he was the savior of the world, then you have all this expectation in the Old Testament. And there's not a 400 years of silence. There's 2,500 years of silence. And you're waiting for God to fulfill all these things in the Old Testament. The Old Testament leading up to this point when God himself would incarnate himself, the Messiah would come and save us. And uh, so we see the whole Old Testament building up to Jesus Christ. And if you don't accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, then the Old Testament starts off and it builds up and builds up and builds up. And then what do you have? The Romans come in and destroy the temple. There's no, even, not, no longer even a place to offer your sacrifices. It's like being caught in limbo. The Old Testament seemed to go nowhere. From Jeremiah to Isaiah to Daniel to Malachi, the Old Testament is full of this eager expectation for the Messiah to come and establish the kingdom of God. We talked about this, this old couple, remember? Zach and his wife Beth, this old priest Zechariah, he would be an expert in the Old Testament. And he was visited by the angel Gabriel. He's, he's uh, ministering in the temple, and suddenly there's a shining person right there, tells him not to be afraid. Uh, and this old guy who had been praying for a child and never got one, kind of questions the angel, and Gabriel says this great line, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of the Lord, and you ain't going to talk for the next nine or ten months. I really think he was hard on him. <laughs> no, I don't want to say anything bad. <laughs> Let's see, I, I, I can still talk, good. We're just going to move on. 
Uh, Zechariah knew what was going on when he heard this uh, prophecy from the angel. And he knew also, by the way, that his son would not be the Messiah. How do you know that? Well, because his family were descendants of Aaron. And he knew that the Messiah had be, to be in the line of David. So it, it, it was not from the priestly side, it was from the kingly side. He knew that his son could not be the Messiah. His son was going to be John the Baptist, right? And moved by the Holy Spirit, this old guy prophesies God's new movement on earth, which was actually the culmination of the Old Testament, and that was going to start with his son, who would be in the spirit of Elijah, remember, and he would become John the Baptist. And Jesus Christ said there's nobody who's lived who is greater than John the Baptist. He's not somebody who who's easily pushed by winds. The wind comes and he goes this way or that way like a chameleon. Not at all. And he probably had in mind some verses from the Old Testament, like Psalm 132, 17. The Messiah is called the Horn of David. When you think of horn, I want you to think like of, of a buffalo or one of those big African uh, buffalo, water buffaloes, or, or maybe of a, a rhinoceros with his massive horn. For the Israelites, a horn was a symbol of strength like a strong man. or So the Messiah is going to be the horn of David. From David's line, the strength, uh, the, the Messiah would come in strength and power. 2 Samuel, verses 7, 16, God promised David an everlasting kingdom. In fact, he promised that to Abraham as well several times, this everlasting kingdom. But everybody knew that their kingdom had been destroyed by the Assyrians and, and the Persians ruled over and then the Romans ruled over. And then for a long time, there was no kingdom of Israel until it was established just in recent times, once again, again, answer to prophecy. Uh, so what was that? Well, we're not going to get into a lot of it today, but I want to explain this idea of kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is used in several senses uh, by Jesus himself in the New Testament. One sense, when you become a Christian, when you humble yourself and say, I'm wrong, God's right, Lord God, I see what you did on the cross for my sins. Please forgive me. I want to be part of your family. I deny myself. I accept you. When, when you do that, and God eagerly he welcomes you in like a long-lost child. He, he loves to bring people into his family. He's, he's quick to forgive. When you do that, uh, the kingdom of God is actually birthed in your heart. You have the kingdom of God alive within you. And then in, in another sense, when the church comes together, that the church, the great invisible church, not people who sit in a pew but don't really believe, not this denomination or that denomination, but every single true believer, regardless of what church they're in, all across the globe, that is the kingdom of God, and we grow the kingdom of God by pushing out the boundaries. But there's another sense where we're waiting for the messianic kingdom, the millennial kingdom, a kingdom of a thousand years, where God comes and raises uh, rules in person on the planet Earth, and that is the kingdom of God, and it will cover the entire Earth. And so there's different ways in which the kingdom of God is brought about person by person. And right now, what we can do, what you and I can do, what our church can do, which every Bible-believing church needs to be doing, is drawing more and more people into this kingdom by faith in Jesus Christ. Zechariah knew that the prophets foretold the coming of the Davidic Messiah also as a baby. Uh, Isaiah, uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 9, listen to this. The people walking in darkness. So we've seen that same theme now in Malachi. We're seeing it again in Isaiah. We're going to see that in the New Testament too. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. And I want you to think about that again. It's like in winter. It's dark. There's wolves all around. You're alone. You're out in the forest. It's dark. You're cold. You're afraid. There is no hope. And then suddenly, rising up over the, over the mountaintops, through the trees, the clouds aren't there, the sun rises in light and warmth. You see, oh, there's the path. And hope fills your heart. The light of God came when Jesus Christ came to the earth. And it gave light to all of us so we could find our way to God, that we could find uh, how to be in right relationship with God. Jesus came. So the people walking in darkness had seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation, God. You have increased their joy. Joy is one of the fruits of the Spirit. It's a sign of spiritual maturity. Let's walk in joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, that warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke 
that burdens them. And God shatters our yokes and, and all the, of all of our burdens. He, he says, bring those to me and he'll carry them for us. And the bar across their shoulders, the rod of the oppressor, every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning. It means no more war, peace in our lives, peace between us and God. And if we practice if we practice God's will in our lives, peace in our relationships, peace in our church, peace among brothers and sisters. So all, all the instruments of war are done away with. It will be fuel for the fire. For to us, a child is born. So we have this expectation in the Old Testament. We're waiting for this child to be born that's going to bring the righteousness of God, that's going to bring God's truth, God's kingdom uh, to us. And the government will be on his shoulders. He'll take responsibility for this rulership. And he will be called, listen to, this, what, listen to what this child will be called. Tell me if this sounds like an ordinary child to you. He will be called Wonderful Counselor. Isn't that beautiful? Some people say maybe the commas there. He will be called Wonderful. I like that too. He will be called Counselor. He will be called Mighty God. Now there's a good clue that this is not a normal child uh, if you're calling your kid mighty God, uh, well, there's problems. We've got to talk. He will be called everlasting father. So the baby born is going to be called everlasting father, prince of peace, of the greatness of his government and peace. There will be no end. And remember, when Christ died for our sins on the cross and rose again in power, he started the church. He placed his kingdom within our hearts. This is the beginning of the kingdom of God. This kingdom, the gates of hell, cannot stand against it. Nothing can stop this kingdom, and it will have no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness. From that time on and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. And old Zach, the priest in the temple, he knew this. He knew all this. And the angel comes and says, you guys are old, you and your wife, Beth. But God is going to bring you joy. He's going to give you a son. He's going to be a source of joy to you. And he is going to go before the Messiah and prepare a way for him. Zechariah also knew God's promises to Abraham. God promised Abraham descendants, descendants greater than the sands, greater than the stars. He promised him land. The land of Israel was promised to Abraham and his descendants. He promised personal blessing on Abraham. And a promise in Genesis tw chapter 12 and Genesis chapter eight, 28 to bless the whole world through him. If it's not Jesus Christ who is the culmination, the answer to that promise, then where is the answer to that promise? God, all these thousands of years ago, said the whole world will be blessed through your descendant. And here we have Jesus Christ drawing all the world unto himself, dying for our sins, Raising to life so that we know that he keeps his promises, that this is a God who saves, this is a God who is mighty. John MacArthur points out that oftentimes we Christians, we see the birth of Jesus as the start of the New Testament, don't we? But when we're looking at the Magnificat we saw with Mary, when we're looking at how, how, how this old priest, Zachariah, and his wife, Elizabeth, heard the angel and what they were thinking of, they were all thinking with their scriptures, which means they didn't have the New Testament, did they? They, they heard all of these words in light of the Old Testament prophecies. So another way to understand the birth of Jesus is not the beginning of the New Testament, but the fulfillment, the coming together, the culmination of everything, every hope in the Old Testament. Jesus himself said, he said, don't think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I'm not coming to do away, to forget about the law and the prophets. I came not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Jesus claimed, I am the fulfillment of all these Old Testament hopes. Jesus said, I'm the one. I'm not setting those aside. I'm fulfilling them all. And we don't live under the Old Testament laws, not because Jesus said, okay, those are done with, ignore them. It's because he fulfilled them in a way that no human being ever could. So it's fulfilled. The Old Testament was fulfilled. And now we live under the grace of God, and we, we serve and we worship out of love for such a great God we have, and we... We deny ourselves and we pick up that cross and we start loving people and we start treating people the way God wants us to <coughs> because of our Savior Jesus Christ. Because, not because we're afraid of punishment because of the Old Testament laws, because we've been saved from the law by the blood of Jesus Christ. We serve because of 
our response. He first loved us. Now we want to love him. And it's not loving him when we hold a grudge. It's not loving him when we have bitterness in our hearts. It's not loving him when lust fills everything in our, in our thoughts. It's not loving him when what I can get and what I can grab a hold of is more important than him in our lives. Let's respond to his love with gratitude and with love on our own. And Zechariah didn't know Jesus. He didn't know about the cross. But he did know that God was going to answer all this Old Testament prophecy. And just like God did not forget them in Egypt, but he brought them out, Zechariah says, 400 years of silence, but you did not forget us. You remembered your promises. He said, thank you, God. They're coming true right here, right now. As we read the rest of chapter 1 now, I want you to notice a couple things. One, the story of John the Baptist is kind of really similar to the story of Isaac, isn't it? Both Abraham and Sarah uh, got old in age, and they didn't have a child. And when they heard that they were going to have a child, they kind of doubted it, and, la and Sarah laughed. And she, the angel says, God says, you laughed. She says, no, I didn't. He says, yes, but you did. Uh, and then uh, Zechariah and, and Elizabeth, well beyond the time when, they sh when it should have been possible for them to have children, God delights in doing the unexpected. You have a God that can accomplish what we can't. Amen? God delights in doing what is unexpected. Amen? Amen? And when everything seems hopeless and dark, God can come through when nobody else can. Amen? Secondly, think about Zechariah's faith. He has great faith. He has this understanding of the Old Testament. But honestly, his words and the words of the song he sings demonstrate he really didn't understand what was going to come next. We get the big picture because we have the New Testament. And we have the Holy Spirit residing within us. But he had the Old Testament. But he trusted, listen to this, he didn't know what was going to come next. But he trusts God and God commends him for his faith. Sisters, brothers, we're the foot soldiers. We're not the general. God calls the shots. We don't have to know what comes next in our lives. He was faithful. Listen, he was faithful when they didn't have that child. Here is a priest blessing others. And it felt like he himself was not blessed. And yet he was faithful and faithful and faithful as an old man. His wife's an old gal. All those years of unanswered. They saw the other people's children. They were happy for them. But their hearts kind of broke, right? But they had faith regardless of their situation. And God commends them for us. We don't know. Uh, you know, when we get sick, God can heal. We always pray for healing. We've seen God heal. But you know what? Sometimes he said, I'd rather take my child home. Do we have faith when things don't go our way? Financially, do we have faith when all around us, people we thought we could trust are not there letting us down? Do we have faith when we blow it so bad we can hardly stand ourselves? Do we have faith to still live in grace when our prayers aren't answered the way we want them to be? Zechariah is an example of lifelong faith that doesn't give up on God, come what may. Brothers and sisters, you and I, we don't have to have all the answers. We don't. And quit fooling yourself. You're not going to have all the answers. You will not always know why this happened or that happened. We have to know Jesus is the answer. We don't have to know what comes next if we know who is next to us, which is Emmanuel, God with us at the hospital, God with us when other people aren't there for us, God with us when our life is falling apart. And we have to know we don't have to know the future when we know who holds the future. Last week we saw Mary as a powerful exa example, this teenage girl of fierce faith in the face of terrible adversity. Her life was blown apart, all her hopes and dreams gone. A teenage girl who pleased heaven by her faith, by her willingness to serve. Let it be done unto me as, as you have said, I am the Lord's maidservant. Now I want us to be encouraged by the faith of this old couple whose trust in God has stood the uh, test of time, uh, a lifetime of disappointment. I also want to mention that uh, this is not a, maybe this is a newsflash. Did you know that uh, non-Christians don't believe in prophecy? 
Obviously, right? If they start to believe the prophecy, it's a pretty short jump to put their faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, most non-Christians, the vast majority, don't believe in a prophecy that we've been talking about this morning, uh, obviously. So some non-Christian Bible scholars, not all of them, say that the early Christians probably made up this connection between Jesus and John the Baptist because, as we said before, John the Baptist was more popular in his day than Jesus was. And so they were trying to steal or leech off of John's popularity for Jesus. Or most scholars believe that they did have this connection, that they were probably related. Uh, no reason to dispute that. Uh, but they will still say that these scenes with Gabriel and the prophetic songs of Mary and Zechariah were, were made up. Remember, this is not what I'm saying. This is what some scholars who don't believe in God were saying. Uh, they would say that Zechariah's song was made up long after Jesus was gone to make it look like John prepared the way for Jesus. So the last thing I want you to keep in mind, keep somewhere in the back of your mind, uh, with Mary and Zechariah's song, as I'm reading through Zechariah's song, listen, obviously, obviously this song is so Old Testament in its focus. Obviously this song was composed was by somebody who didn't know what was going to come next. Obviously, it was composed before the public ministry, the crucifixion, the resurrection of Christ. If it was written after the fact, he could have tied in all those strands. But instead, this is an old man of faith looking with all he has, which is the Old Testament prophecies. And you can see that in the song we're about to. So Luke is recording uh, these songs from Mary and Zechariah just as they were remembered and passed on to him if these songs were written after Christ, they would have been a lot different than they are. So I want you to see the Old Testament mentality. I talked about it last week, and I'm going to talk about it this week again. From verse 57. Okay, so Mary uh, probably stayed with Elizabeth until the baby was born, little cute, chubby-cheeked John the Baptist. And she went back. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. Isn't that beautiful? This old gal, I mean, everybody was astonished. She finally gets a child. You know all the women were coming, and they were so happy. All the joy in her family and in the neighborhood, all, all this joy. And, and everybody knows there's something going on here. And, and remember, they would say, remember 10 months ago? When, old, when the old priest went in, into the, in to, the, to minister to the Lord, he came out and he was supposed to give a blessing to the people and he can't talk and he can't hear and he, he's just he's stammering up there and we all thought, wow, he must have seen a vision. They remember, this is miraculous and not only is he a vision, then 10 months later, this old woman, maybe 60s, probably 70s or 80s, is with child and people, are, people just know something weird, something beautiful, something amazing is going on. On the eighth day, according to Old Testament law, okay, on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, no, he is to be called John. Now, there was somebody there, maybe old Aunt Bessie, and she decided to argue this. I don't know why. Mom says, no, his name is going to be John. His, his, his gal says, there is no one among your relatives who has that name. I, I think some of the people were a little offended. She was just, well, you're going to call him John. <coughs> so they made signs to the father to find out what he would like to name the child. They made signs because, again, he can't hear, he can't speak. He asked for a writing tablet. I don't know what he did. Is it just a chisel? He probably went like this, you know, or maybe paint like this. or I don't know how he did it. But he asked for, for a writing tablet in, uh, to find out what he would name the child. He asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment... What? His name is, there's expectation. Chisel, 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 chisel. His name is John. Immediately his mouth was open, his tongue was loose, and he began to speak, praising God. You notice that? He was doubting the word of God 10 months ago. And his tongue was tight. He couldn't say a thing. He couldn't hear. He puts his faith in the word of God. The angel tells him in verse 13, I think it was, verse 13 of chapter 1, the child's going to be named John. He acts in accordance with God's will, and suddenly he's filled up with praising God. Let's live our lives according to God's will. Brothers and sisters, let's believe what God has said, and then we're not going to be able to help it. 
We're, praise for God is just going to overflow from us. We're going we're gonna to testify. We're going to bring this message of what God has done in our lives to everyone. Our tongue will be loosed. We're no longer to have a, a clamp down mouth because we're going to be so filled up with the Holy Spirit. Put your faith in God. Believe the words of God and praise will erupt from us like a volcano. So immediately his mouth was open, his tongue was loosed, and his mouth began praising God. The neighbors were all filled with awe. And throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all of these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, what then is this child going to be? Isn't that beautiful? Everybody knew, wow, something. God is doing something, for the Lord's hand is with this child. His father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he prophesied. Now remember what I've taught before. When we say prophecy, it's not foretelling the future. It's telling forth the word of God. Sometimes when you speak prophetically, God is going to give an insight to the future. But what we often see, even with people we call prophets in the Old Testament, they're not giving a new word. They're bringing the word of God that's already been revealed to bear on a specific situation. And Zechariah is bringing forth, telling forth the word of God. Now listen. I, I went through all those Old Testament verses. There was a reason for that. I set me up for Zechariah's song. Zechariah has all that in mind as he speaks out here. Praise be to the Lord. So he sounds just like, just like he comes right out of Psalms, right? Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. God is a redeemer. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us. This horn is this, uh, a mighty man in the house of his servant David. He has said, as he said to his prophets, his holy prophets long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. He's quoting right out of those verses I read. And have you noticed already, this is not written the way a New Testament person would write it. He's really focused on Israel, isn't he? This was written before the life, the ministry, the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. All the focus on Israel. You wouldn't start a, a Greek religion and tie it did sin so deeply with, with Israel in, in, uh, old, in, in Jewish hopes and, and aspirations. Salvation from our enemies in the hand of all who hate us to show mercy to our ancestors and, and remember his holy covenant, uh, the oath he swore to our father Abraham to rescue us from the hand of our enemies, to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all of our days. And you, my child, so now he's singing to his son. I made a lot of songs for each one of my kids, and I still sing them to them, and I think it probably embarrasses them. But I, I used to sing them when they were just this little, and now they're this big, and I'm still singing to them. But not really, but it feels like it. And you, my child, remember this is John the Baptist, you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare the way for him. He's preparing the path for the Messiah. To give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Salvation, forgiveness of our sins. Don't you want to be saved from all the darkness inside of you? Don't you want to be saved from your own stubbornness? Don't you want to be saved from that wickedness inside of you? God loves you and he will forgive you completely and he will take you just as you are. Because Jesus took care of all of that on the cross. <coughs> so he says, my son, you're going to be called a prophet of the Most High. For you're going to go before the Lord. You're going to prepare the way. You're going to prepare the Jewish people for the coming of the Messiah. Uh, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God. By which the rising of Oh, we saw that a couple times in the Old Testament, didn't we? by which the rising of the sun will come on us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. And God didn't just save you from our sins. He saved you to bring you to the path of peace. Peace in your relationship with God. You're no longer at war with God. You're not making excuses for your sin. You're no longer denying God, but also peace in your own heart. I'm not living under condemnation anymore. I, I'm not living under this incredible guilt anymore. And again, if we practice the word of God, peace between husbands and wives, peace between parents and their children, 
peace between one another in the church because I desire good for you and you desire good for me and I want to see you walk close to Jesus and you want to see me walk close to Jesus. And when you stumble or I stumble, we're not there to kick people when they're down. We're there to lovingly lift them up because church is a safe place to be broken because we have a good Savior. God came to bring peace. And God is a relational God, peace in all of our relationships, first and foremost, peace in our relationship to God. We could not offer peace because we're the, we're the ones who offended God. We're the sinners. We're imperfect. We're broken. But God, in goodness, could reach down this hand of grace and extend this offer of peace to us. Take that grace. Take that peace. Take that offer and come into the family. And the child grew, and he became strong in spirit, and he lived in the wilderness until he uh, appeared publicly to Israel. Zechariah saw God working. He could not help but rejoice. How dare we not rejoice? Isn't that a kind of pride? If, if we have the cross, if we have the cross, every other blessing is just over the top. We didn't deserve the cross. We do not deserve God coming down in flesh and dying for our sins. We have the gift of forgiveness, we have eternal life. Now, if I get blessed with some material blessings, if I get blessed with good relationships, if I get blessed with a, a wonderful church, if I get blessed with, the, with a voice to be able to sing praise, any all these other blessings, health, all those are just extra. Those are over the top. We already have enough, no matter how dark life gets, we already have enough to live lives of rejoicing because of the birth, the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let's walk in that joy. Let's walk in that joy. Who wants to be a curse for everybody else in the church? Who wants to raise their hand right now and say, Lord, I want to aspire to be a curse to my wife. I want to be a curse to my husband. I want to be so uh, overbearing, I'm a curse to my children. I want to be a curse to the person who sits behind me at church. I want to be a curse. Who wants to be a curse? No, let's aspire to be blessings to one another. God has so richly blessed us and brought us peace. Let's turn around and be blessings to everyone else. And let's walk in that joy because anything less than that is sin. J. Vernon McGee said, as a rule... Weaker saints, weaker saints, people who are weak in their faith. As a rule, J. Vernon McGee says, weaker saints don't do much rejoicing. The stronger saints with more faith rejoice in all circumstances. God, the fruit of the Spirit, I want that in my life. It's so easy for me to grouse and complain and, and to be, live in fear, live under condemnation, to be critical, hard-headed, judgmental, so immature. Don't let life stop you, brothers and sisters. Set Jesus before you. Pursue him. Chase him. Run after him. Hunger and thirst after the Holy Spirit. Don't let other people stop you. If they're not going to follow, I've decided to follow Jesus, and it doesn't matter the world behind me, it doesn't matter if they don't go, don't none go with me. Still, I will. Let nobody else stop you with their unfaithfulness. No, let nobody else stop you when they let you down. Let nobody else stop you when they don't measure up to all your expectations for them. And brothers and sisters, don't let your own flesh stop you. Listen, don't tell me. I've messed up my life. I can't go to church. Do you ever think that you deserve to go to church in the first time and stand in the presence of holy God? We're not here because we deserve to be here. We're here because of the blood of Jesus Christ, and you can't out -sin God's grace. So when God, when God convicts us of our sin, it's the devil that wants to put his boot on us and make us miserable and remind us how wicked we are, but it's Jesus Christ and his Holy Spirit that wants to lift us up and restore us to relationship. When we understand our sin, don't you dare, don't ever run away from God. Run right back into his arms because he's right there. And he loves to see his kids run back to him in faith. So don't let your own flesh, don't let life stop you. Don't let other people stop you. Don't let your own flesh stop you from rejoicing in the Lord. I rejoice in the Lord 
because I have such a good God that loves me. Zechariah, this old priest, did not have the New Testament, but we can learn about rejoicing from him, can't we? And look at how faithful God is. All those Old Testament prophecies came and fulfilled them through John the Baptist and, and, and Jesus Christ. And in his own life, that whole life, praying for that kid, probably thought, well, I'm going to still follow God. I want a child, but it didn't come. And then God bringing that fulfillment, Lord God, uh, Lord God, please help us to walk. Uh, we want to walk in joy. We don't want to make bitterness and disappointment our idols. We want to set your son Jesus Christ before our eyes. And, and Lord, if nobody else goes with us, still we're going to follow. Lord, we want to chase after you. We want to cling to you. We want to walk in the joy of your spirit. Lord, give us hope. Give us peace. Loosen our tongues so that we can praise your son and, and your plans and the plan of salvation and, and, and give our testimony of, of your goodness and greatness everywhere we go, Lord. And Father, I want to ask for each and every person in our church that you give us the joy and pleasure of leading other people to Christ this year. Father, please uh, grow our church and not only our church, but every uh, Bible-believing church in our city, in our community, in our nation, Lord, and across the world, Lord. We pray that you would uh, give them strength and make them mighty and let them push forward your kingdom, Lord, and that the kingdom of God would grow in our hearts and in this world. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Jamesville Athletic Club.